بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, This is the third lecture in the skin histology to describe skin appendages Appendages are derived from the downward growth of epidermal epithelium during development and these appendages include hair, sebaceous glands, sweat glands and the nail However, the nail is not so typical downward growth as we will see shortly. Starting by the hair. The hair, we have to know the definition and the structure of the hair. As regards the definition, it is a keratinized thread. So very important to remember the word keratinized. And this thread develops from the hair follicles, so this is another important information. Development of the hair from the hair follicle, and it is nothing but keratinized thread, formed of keratinized cells. The color, the size, distribution of the hair depend on four points, age, sex, race, and body region. The growth of the hair depends on two factors, which are the body region and the hormones. We all know that uh, the growth of the hair on the scalp is more than that on the surface of the body. The eyelashes has uh, definitely more or less fixed lens. As regards the hormones, the hair line in the male usually recedes by age. And also, the, in both sexes, the uh, thinning of hair takes place due to the drop in the level of the estrogen. As regards the structure, we have to remember three words. It is a modified stratum corneum. It is a modified stratum corneum, which is the layer present on the surface of the epidermis of the skin. It is formed of shaft projecting on the surface of the skin, root embedded in the follicle under the surface of the skin, and finally the follicle, which will give rise to the hair. The shaft has different lengths, and it is, as I have said, it is present above the skin. It is the part you see. The root is embedded in the hair follicle, but it has the same structure like the shaft. Both of them are made of keratinized cells. Here it is the shaft, and this is the root. Both of them have the same structure, which is keratinized, keratinized cells. The structure of the shaft or the root, as I have said, formed of uh, keratinized cells. But these keratinized cells are present in three uh, compartments from inwards to outwards are. The innermost part is the medulla. Medulla nukhaa, yani lub ptaha, ptaha al hair. This medulla is formed of keratinized cells, but the keratin here is of the soft type. Then we have this uh, yellow area, which is the cortex. Cortex يعني إشرة. يعني الحتة اللي هي هتبقى more superficial to the medulla. يبقى دي إشرة وده نخاع. This cortex is formed of hard keratin. And very important to remember that it is pigmented. It is the area where the pigment is present and it gives the color of the hair. Then we have the outermost layer, like this one. It is called the cuticle. And this cuticle, as you see, it is in the form of hard keratin, but the keratin here in the form of scales that interdigitate with the next layer in the inner root cheese. So the hair is formed of central medulla, soft, and then the cortex pigmented and hard keratin, and then the cuticle also hard, and it is interdigitating with the first layer in the inner root cheese, which is also called the cuticle, 
and by this interdigitation, it fixes the hair in the hair follicle. Remember that the soft keratin is in the center, in the medulla, but the hard is in the cortex and in the cuticle. The difference between the soft and the hard keratin is due to the content of um, the disulfide bonds or the sulfur containing amino acids. So the more these bonds, the more it is hard. After that, um, we will talk about the third component, which is the hair follicle, which is the part formed by the downward invagination of the epidermis into the dermis, and it is the part responsible for the formation of the hair. This uh, part uh, is formed of three cheeses, inner root cheese, inner root cheese, and outer root cheese, and connective tissue cheese. So we have uh, three layers. The innermost one here, which is formed of three layers from inside outwards, is the first one of this inner root cheese, is the cuticle. And this cuticle, as I have said, it is interdigitating with the cuticle of the hair. So the hair is formed of uh, the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. The inner root cheese, which is the area from here to there, is formed also of the cuticle that interdigitate with the cuticle of the hair, and this helps the fixation of the hair in the hair follicle. After that, we have this layer, which is called the Huxley layer. Huxley layer is the middle layer, and finally we have the Henle layer. The Henle layer. So we have uh, cuticle, Huxley, and Henle. You uh, can remember these layers by the fact that the cuticle is the first one to interdigitate with the cuticle of the hair. And then we have Huxley and Henle. Henle is a name that will be studied in the kidney as Henle Lou. So it is a known name. Cuticle is a known name. So in between them, we have this um, odd, strange name. So remember that this strange name, Ism al Garib, is present in the center. So we have cuticle, Huxley, and then Hens layer. After that, we have the outer root cheese. So we have inner root cheese formed of three layers, and then we have the outer root cheese. But the outer root cheese is the epidermis itself to be reduced only to basal cells only when we go deep down. So the epidermis will grow downwards to form the outer root cheese of the hair follicle, but at the deep point, these layers will be missing and we will only have the basal cell layer. After that, we have a connective tissue th cheese. This cheese is nothing but loose connective tissue of the dermis, but here it is slightly collected around the hair follicle. And as we know, we have a base membrane between epithelium and connective tissue. Here we have also a well-developed basal lamina between this outer root cheese and connective tissue cheese, which is called the glassy membrane. So it is the glassy membrane which separates between the epithelium in the form of inner, in the form of external or outer root cheese, and the connective tissue cheese. After that, um, we are studied with um, two definitions, hair bulb and hair bulge. This is the bulge and this is the bulb. Starting with the bulb, what is the bulb? The bulb is the terminal dilatation of the hair follicle. The hair follicle dilates deep part in the deep part of the dermis to form this hair bulb. This bulb is invaginated by the connective tissue of the dermis, forming projection called dermal papilla, papilla bruise. Here we have the dermal papilla, which invaginate the hair bulb. And of course, we have here a lot of blood vessels to nourish the hair follicle. 
also we have here as we see this is the dermal papilla formed of connective tissue containing blood vessels and here we have what is called the hair matrix the hair matrix is formed of uh, these cells that will give rise to the cortex medulla cuticle of the hair as well as the internal or the inner root cheese so these cells will give rise to the hair as a total and the inner root cheese while the outer root cheese is the downward growth of the epidermis of the skin and notice that between these uh, matrix cells we have these branched cells with the uh, rounded melanosomes these are the melanocytes so these melanocytes will form the melanin due to the presence of tyrosinase enzyme and deliver this melanin to what layer of the hair of course to the colored layer which is the cortex so the melanin is delivered to the cortex of the hair so that to give uh, the color of the hair while the medulla as you see is not pigmented at all don't forget that the medulla is soft keratin the cortex and the cuticle are hard keratin uh, also the inner root cheese is formed the three layers of the inner root cheese are formed of hard keratin so oh this is hard keratin inner root cheese and this is the um, uh, layers of the hair we have only soft in the medulla and we have hard in the cortex and in the cuticle so by this we can see what is called the hair bulb the hair bulb has an important function as it is responsible for the production of the hair and also the growth so from this bulb formed of connective tissue dermal papilla and formed of matrix cells with melanocytes the hair is developed and it is elongated now, what about the hair or the follicular bulge the bulge is another thing related to the hair follicle it is a region at the upper part of the external root cheese this is the external root cheese this is the internal root cheese and this is the external root cheese which is the downward growth of the epidermis at the upper part of the outer root cheese we can see this um, hair bulge in this hair bulge we can see this uh, collection or aggregation of cells these cells are called epithelial stem cells they are undifferentiated cells but they are epithelial not mesenchymal they are epithelial stem cells and remember the abbreviation capital e s for these cells these cells here has uh, uh, functions which are very important these cells under normal conditions will give rise to uh, these or give rise to cells that will pass to the sebaceous gland help in its uh, development and its regeneration also it will give rise to the cells that will pass to the uh, hair bulb and reach the matrix cells and give rise to the cells of the hair as well as the inner root cheese so it will help to form the hair and the inner root cheese and also to form the sebaceous gland again what is the epidermal stem cell epidermal stem cell and don't forget the es capital these are um, undifferentiated uh, epithelial cells that uh, will help to form the sebaceous gland as well as the hair and the inner root cheese not the outer root cheese which is a down, downward uh, uh, growth of the epidermis it has another important function when the skin is wounded or burned these cells will migrate to this area of the wound or injury and it will help in uh, uh, initiation of the healing of this wound again as a summary we have the epithelial stem cells which are undifferentiated epithelial cells present at the follicular bulge 
which is present at the upper part of the outer root sheath where the erector pili muscle is attached. A care that these cells do not contribute to the basal cells. They are not present in the basal cell layer of the epidermis under normal conditions. The functions of these cells are growth of the hair and the sebaceous glands, and in case of the wounds, they migrate to the area of the wound to help in the healing process. Again, this is the hair pulp. The hair pulp is the terminal dilatation of the hair follicle. Here it is invaginated by the connective tissue of the dermis forming dermal papilla. Papilla is a projection, and this dermal papilla is rich in the blood vessels. And inside this bulb, we have the matrix cells, hair matrix cells together with the melanocytes that will give the color to the hair cortex. The bulb or the matrix cells here are responsible for the growth of the hair. And we know now that the matrix cells are originating from the epithelial stem cells present at the hair, at the hair or the follicular part. Here we are talking about the color of the skin. The color of the skin depends on the content of melanin, which is the the brown-black pigment produced by the melanocytes present in the hair bulb and transferring this melanin to the cortical uh, material of the hair. Now, what about the gray hair? In this condition, the melanocytes fail to produce tyrosinase. And most commonly it occurs at old age, but sometimes it starts at a young age due to genetic uh, uh, control. Uh, another uh, picture is the yellow hair. The yellow hair, red hair, is due to the presence of uh, another form of melanin pigment. The melanin pigment are actually of three main types. Eumelanin, that's to say the typical melanin, which is brown to black, and the pheomelanin, and then neuromelanin. The pheomelanin is this pigment which, when present under the control of uh, genetic inheritance, will give uh, the yellow coloration of the hair. Another picture is the baldness, sala, which is the regression, first regression of the hairline, and then the loss of this hair. And this, of course, depends on the genetic factors and hormonal control. Now we are finished with the first appendage in the skin. Now we are moving to the second one, which is the sebaceous glands. The sebaceous glands should be discussed in the following six points. At first of all, the type of this gland. This gland is simple. Simple means one duct. Alveolar means that the secretory part or this alveolus here is in the form of a pear shape. Here it is simple alveolar or branched alveolar. Branched means that the secretory part is branched but it's still having one duct. So it is a simple but it is branched. When it, have, when it has uh, multiple uh, alveoli opening in one duct, so it is called the branched alveolar. Then we have to know what about the side. Of course, we have seen before that this sebaceous glands is located in the dermis of the skin. What type of skin? Only thin skin. And it is usually associated with the hairs. But in rare conditions, like the eyelid, these sebaceous glands are slightly modified and it, it has no relation to the hair follicles of the eyelash. The secretory part of this, uh, of this gland, the part which produces the secretion, is characterized by having just two types of cells. We have basal, flattened, peripheral cells. These cells are germinal cells. Of course, now you know what is the origin of these cells. The origin of these cells is the 
epithelial stem cells present at the follicular bulge. These germinal cells will give rise to the other type of the cells, which is the large polyhedral, means many surfaces, vacuolated because of the presence of these uh, fatty or lipid droplets, so it is vacuolated with a central rounded nuclei. Towards the center of this alveolus, the nuclei are now dark and showing degeneration, and then these cells will rupture, release the whole content of the lipid to, through the duct. So this uh, type of gland is a holocrine, where the cell is completely passing through the secretion. The excretory part is formed of a short and wide duct, which opens in the upper third of the hair follicle. And it is lined with the same epithelium as the epidermis, which is the stratified squamous epithelium. Notice here this is the epidermis, and this is the connective tissue, superficial layer of the connective tissue. Here the epidermis will form the lining of the ducts, which is, which is a short and wide duct. And also notice that it is continuous with the outer root sheath, because the outer root sheath is the downward growth of the epidermis of the skin. This is the outer root sheath, this is the connective tissue sheath, and this is the inner root sheath. What are the layers in the inner root sheath? We have three. Remember their names and their order. What about the outer root sheath? It is the epidermis. And what about the connective tissue cheese? It is the connective tissue related to this hair follicle separated from the outer cheese by membrane. Remember the name of this membrane. As regards the mode of secretion, as I have told you that the cells here gradually undergo degeneration and the nucleus gradually become dark and uh, pycnotic and the cell will degenerate, releasing their content of oily material. The sebum, the hundayen, is nothing but oily secretion. What is the function of this oil that will pass through the duct through the hair follicle to appear on the surface of the skin? This oil will help to keep the skin, the thin skin, and its hair soft. Why? Because it prevents the dehydration, it prevents the uh, cracking, teshakkuk. So, this oily material is very important to protect uh, this thin skin. At the same time, this sebum has an antifungal and antibacterial function. Otherwise, the fungi and the bacteria present all over uh, the world, all over the, the air we breathe, will uh, infect our skin and produce uh, severe diseases. Uh, when the ducts of these sebaceous glands are obstructed, the secretion will accumulate in the uh, glands. This will be followed by bacterial infection. As a result, acne will appear on the face. So acne, or hab shabab, it is nothing but chronic, musmin, inflammation, iltihab of obstructed sebaceous glands. So the obstruction takes place first, then accumulation of secretion, then the inflammation, and it is a chronic case. After that, we are facing the nail. In order to study the nail, we should understand first that it is nothing but keratinized cells like that of stratum coli. It is nothing but stratum coli. The nail is formed of three parts. Free edge, which the part which we usually cut, and the major part is the body, the part, the major part which appears on the surface, it is the body or the plate, and the part which is 
covered by fold of skin, it is called the root. Starting by the free edge. Here, this is the free edge or free end. It is the anterior margin of the nail plate. Uh, the hypomechium, it is an epithelium under this nail plate, under the nail plate, that present between the free edge and the skin over the finger. So this area is called hyponychium. Actually, it forms a seal, tefl, to protect the bed of the nail, to protect this nail bed, which is very important. So this seal is called hyponychium. Onychium in Latin means little claw, مخلب صغير. So the free end, it is the, the part which is the anterior margin of the nail plate and uh, under it we have uh, this seal called hyponychium to uh, protect the nail bed. After that we have the nail plate. This is the main part. It lies over the nail bed. Serir betao, nail bed. The nail bed here is formed of two elements. Malbigian cell layer, here. Basal cell layer, bricket cell layer, Malbigian cell layer. And it is uh, known as also by another name, the sterile matrix. Because this mat, why it is a sterile? Because it has no relation to the production of the nail or the growth of the nail. So it is called the sterile matrix. Under this epithelium, we have the vascular dermis, very vascular dermis. And it is characterized by no papillae. Here we can see that the base membrane has no papillae in this area, which is called the nail bed. After that, we are left by the root. The root, it is the part which is covered by a proximal fold of the skin called proximal nail fold. Uh, the edge of this fold, this edge, this anterior edge, is called eponychium. Eponychium, it, is, it means upon, over the nail. We have said that Onychion means little claw. So this is the eponychium, which is composed of hard keratin. And because it is a hard keratin, it does not disquamate like the soft keratin. Because it is, and because it is very thin, this area is very thin, it tends to break off. Diamond tatata. Or, as with many individuals, it is trimmed that us or pushed back. We have here the, uh, in case of the root, we have the proximal nail fold and we have the apo, this is the aponychium. Okay, in this groove, in this groove, we have here the nail matrix. What is the nail matrix? The cells of the Malpighian cell layer, the basal cell layer, and the brickle cell layer that lie in this groove, in this groove in which the root is embedded, that lie in this groove, these are called the nail matrix. The proliferation of these cells will result into the growth of the nail plate. When we look to the nail, we will have the body we we have nail folds, lateral folds of the skin, and we have here the eponychium, which is uh, cuticle also, and then we have this uh, lunula. Lunula, it is uh, the crescent, the hilal, shaped area at the base of the nail plate. Why it is white? Because the matrix cells here are partially keratinized. When it is completely keratinized, like this area, it will be more transparent, but here it is highly opaque and whitish because of the partial keratinization. 
the lateral nail folds cover the lateral sides of the nail. Now we have finished the nail and it's time now to discuss the sweat glands. The sweat glands are of two types and we have to differentiate between the both, both types. First, as regards the site, we have eccrine and we have apocrine. Eccrine glands, sweat glands are present all over the body, but the apocrine present only in thin skin in three locations in the axilla and in the pubic area and in the perineal area around the anus as regards the mode of secretion actually the eccrine gland is a merocrine gland and the apocrine gland was first thought to be an apocrine but later on it was discovered that it is a merocrine also and the name apocrine is just a misnomer. So both of them are merocrine. What is the meaning of merocrine? Miro means just. Crine means secretion. So this gland will produce secretion only with no loss of the cell or a part of the cell. Then we have the third difference, which is related to the secretory part. In case of the eccrine glands, which are present all over the body, this secretory part of this gland formed of three types of cells. At first, we have the myoepithelial cells present around the uh, secretory acinus, uh, and we have also clear cells and dark cells. As regards the clear cells, they are, as we see, the most numerous. And they have a, a pale cytoplasm due to their content of glycogen that dissolves during preparation of the section, giving a pale appearance for the cytoplasm. And they have central rounded nuclei. And they have a narrow apex white base, like a, yani, somewhat like a, a pyramid. And by the electron microscope, they show numerous microvilli as well as intercellular canaliculi. In between these uh, cells, we have canaliculi. These canaliculi are called intercellular, yani قنوات بينية between these cells. And the cells will pull the secretion first to the intercellular canaliculi before the secretion passes to the lumen of the secretory essence. On the other side, we have the third type, which is fewer in number. As we see, we have here a lot of clear cells, but just few, one or two of the dark cells. And the dark cells have a wide apex and a narrow base. And the cytoplasm is very dark, and it shows some granules. These granules are glycoprotein in nature. That's to say, carbohydrate and protein element. Under the electron microscope, we expect what we expect, the uh, well-developed rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. Because the Golgi apparatus is a part of the organelle which adds the carbohydrate element in uh, the uh, protein secretion produced by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. After that, we have to discuss the other part, which is the apocrine gland, the secretory part of the apocrine gland. As we see here, we have only two types of cells, myoepithelial cells at the periphery. Of course, we remember the myoepithelial cells help in squeezing of this secretory, duct, a secretory part and pouring the secretion into the duct. Here we have the second type of cell is these uh, cubical cells, a pseudophilic cytoplasm, central rounded nuclei. And they show some granules on the top of the cell. By the electron microscope, we observe the well development of uh, the Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria, the lysosomes, and the presence of lipo pigment which are nothing but residual bodies 
that uh, uh, remain in the cell and acquire uh, pigmentation and this pigmentation increases with the age. We all remember that these lipophoscin pigment have been seen in the nerve cell, in the cardiac muscle, and also will be studied in the liver cell. So, in a summary, we have here three types of cells, the clear, the dark, myoepithelial, and here we have two types of cells, these cells, cubical cells, and the myoepithelial cells. Then the excretory part or the excretory duct. Both of them have ducts. They are exocrine glands. And the ducts, both of them acquire a spiral pathway in the derms. But the eccrine gland, the duct will open on the surface of the epidermis and it will pass after passing through the dermis, through it will pass through the epidermis and pour the secretion on the surface of the skin. Here, the apocrine has also a spiral duct that opens in the hair follicle, in the upper third of the hair follicle, where the sweat will appear around the hair on the surface of the skin. In case of the eccrine sweat gland, as we have said, the duct passes through the dermis and then pass through the epidermis. The duct through the dermis is formed of two layers of cubical cells. These are the ducts. And you observe here that the ducts are darker than the secretory part because we have said that the secretory part is formed mainly of clear cells which are pale. So I can diagnose the duct from the secretory part, not only by the layers of the cells, but also by the coloration of the cytoplasm, which is very clear and pale in the secretory part. Here, the excretory duct in the dermis is formed of two layers of cubical cells, while when it passes through the epidermis, it, it passes the sweat will pass between the epidermal cells so we don't have a separate wall. The uh, side walls are formed by the epidermal cells, the different layers of the epidermis. So here, double layer of cubical cells and upward the, in the epidermis, passing through the epidermis, this is the dermis, and when passes through the epidermis, the uh, walls are nothing but the epidermal cells. So when we see these uh, empty spaces in the epidermis, we, we immediately know that these are the ducts of the eccrine glands which are present all over the body, so we can see them in this uh, thick skin. But in case of the... Sorry. But in case of the apocrine gland, the uh, duct that passes through the dermis before opening in the hair follicle is only formed of two layers of cubical cells like those of uh, the eccrine glands, two layers of cubical cells, but the only difference, the site of opening, and the eccrine has an additional part uh, in, in, uh, in more than this excretory duct, we have uh, another part which passes through the epidermis formed by the cells of the epidermis um, in, uh, as we have seen before. Then to the nerve supply. As regards the nerve supply, the eccrine are supplied by cholinergic nerve fibers and they are stimulated by heat and stress. While the apocrine sweat glands are, are supplied by adrenergic nerve fibers and they are not stimulated by heat but by emotional and sensory stimuli. Finally, we have the function. Here in the eccrine sweat glands, the secretion is clear and watery. And the secretion in case of the apocrine starts only at puberty. And especially uh, in the axillary region, it is viscid and milky. 
The main constituent here in the eccrine secretion is water, with the presence of some excretory products like the sodium chloride, the urea, ammonia, and so we are uh, um, considering the skin as an excretory organ. But in case of the apocrine, it is relatively rich in protein, but it contains other organic materials. So we did not um, uh, describe the cells as basophilic cells, but it is a relative comparison between this uh, gland and the other. So relatively, it is uh, more rich in proteins, uh, but uh, don't be confused by the uh, light microscope picture and the electron microscope picture as uh, the secretion is formed of uh, many organic uh, compounds, but by comparison with the eccrine, it is more rich in proteins, while this is more rich in water. And actually, in the eccrine sweat glands, the clear cells are considered to be the main cells which will produce this watery secretion and remove this water from the blood. Here, the secretion is odorless. It is just water, salt, urea, ammonia. But here, the secretion, actually, it is odorless. But when bacterial fermentation or bacterial degradation of these components takes place, of course, the odor will be offensive. And by this, we have uh, finished the sweat glands, the eccrine, and the apocrine. And also we have finished the skin appendages, best wishes.